Okay. Uh, I think we are good to go. Rashi, when Vibhuti ma'am is in, so uh, just to let you know. All right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. A very good morning to one and all present here, and thank you for finding time and joining us for our architecture design lecture series, a studio discourse 2021. My name is Rashi Chavla, and I'm a second year student of the architectural program at Sushant School of Art and Architecture. First, I would like to start with giving you all a brief introduction about our architectural design studio. In January 2020, we as first year students visited Sri Lanka as a part of our off-campus independent study trip. We visited Puranagama and Anuradhapura, Sigiriya Fort, ancient city of Polanaruva, the uh, the Relic Temple in Kandy, and Jeffrey Baba House Number no. 11 in Colombo. After the pandemic, we still have blood memories of the places and people of Sri Lanka. Our design brief is linked to the OCIS as the various towns and settlements offer studies into settlement patterns, social environments, historicity, materiality, and its related visual expressions in architecture. The basic premise of the second year fourth semester design studio situated in Colombo is that of the emergence of the nation along with the related perceptions of time, people and place. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome my fellow colleagues of second year at Sushant School of Art and Architecture, respected faculty, our studio directors, Professor Amrita Madan, the studio, direct, uh, the studio coordinator, mm -hmm. Sikini Hazra, and, the, and our uh, respected dean, Vibhuti Saj, Dr. Vibhuti Sachdev. She is the dean at uh, Sushant School of Art and Architecture and director of architecture planning and design schools, Sushant University. She is qualified as an architect in 1989 from SP Delhi, completed her PhD in 1996 from University of London, and has worked as a conservative consultant, writer, and designer. She has taught at the University of Sussex and written four books and several articles on subjects of Jaipur, traditional knowledge systems, Indian cities, and Indian modernities. She has worked and written extensively on the city of Jaipur, focusing on its planning, architecture, and craft traditions. Since publishing these books, Dr. Sajdev has been a consultant on the restoration of the Jal Mahal in Jaipur, was the design curator of the artwork of its pavilions, and the co-curator of the exhibition Painted Pleasures. Her latest book is on the festival of festivals at the Jaipur court. I welcome you, ma'am. Now, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome our guest speaker for the session, Dr. D.P. Chandra Sekaran and architect Chintaka Vikram Age. So, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. D.P. Chandrasekara. He is the Dean Faculty of Architecture, University of Moratova, Sri Lanka. He has his bachelor's and master's degree in architecture from University of Moratova and PhD from University of Colombo. In addition, he has obtained PG Diploma Heritage Management from IHS Rotterdam. He is a chartered architect. His research, his research interests include social implications in architecture, heritage, management, and vernacular architectural traditions. He has published peer-reviewed journal articles and authored several books, including Heritage Buildings of Sri Lanka, Fortifications Along the Kelani River, and The Temperatures of Sri Lanka, Elevated Image Houses in the Buddhist Image Houses. I welcome you, sir. I will turn over to Dr. D.P. Chandrasekara to share a few words of wisdom and bring to us wealth of information from academia and research at FARU. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, can you start sharing the screen, Madam Hasra? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, I am Deepi uh, Chandra Sekara. Uh, I'm the currently the dean of the faculty of art, uh, and my research interesting and the teaching includes teaching history of Sri Lankan architecture and 
social implications in architecture in addition to uh, the involvements in dissertation and um, the design works uh, i have a little bit of experience of in india visiting several times uh, and my last visit was in 2017 where i was at nit raipur teaching for about three weeks under gyan program um, of the central government of india and when i come to india i feel ho very ease and home because we share similar type of cultures and uh, the people the way of behavior so it's very uh, friendly and a homely situation now what i'm going to talk today is about sri lankan vernacular architecture because uh, I was communicated or told that you are going to work some projects in Sri Lanka and your concerns are about the place, identity, people and uh, the context. Uh, so I thought this vernacular architecture is the best uh, in that to, uh, to, uh, for this kind of a project. I will, I will tell why. Uh, um, uh, and I am very happy to understand that you have been to Anuradhapura, Sigiriya, Polonnaruwa, Kandy and Jeffrey Bauer House in Colombo. Uh, first, I will try to, uh, in my presentation, what I am going to do is I will talk a little bit about Anuradhapura, the, the periodization of Sri Lankan history, then uh, the Anuradhapura and Polonnaruwa. Basically, that's grand architecture, uh, which might not represent the people and the processors to a great extent. They might be isolated examples. Uh, and then uh, come to the Kandy and the Gampola periods, where bulk of our vernacular architecture examples um, are come from and then we'll try to discuss about the vernacular architecture of sri lanka of the candy and gampola periods like uh, 17 uh, 15th to 18th century period fairly recent um, with ref respect to the religious and secular buildings and architecture uh, of sri lanka and then also uh, try to explain the key characteristic features of the Sri Lankan vernacular architecture. Okay, uh, Madam, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, now this is the basic uh, periodization. Um, the the Anuradhapura was the most significant kingdom. Sri Lanka was a, a unitary state from national state, a nation state from a from long period. And uh, the most significant happening is the introduction of Buddhism in the third century BC by King Asoka uh, through his son uh, Arhat Mahinda during the time of Devanam Piyatista, the king of Anuradhapura. So that changed the whole architecture of the country. Uh, prior to that, it's basically we have rock caves, megalithic tombs, which I'm not going to discuss. But Anuradhapura was the kingdom for about 1300 years. So that's a fairly long period. And basically, if you go there, you will see large number of Buddhist monasteries, but in ruined form. Then the shift, uh, kingdom was shifted to Polonnaruwa, that's also in the north central area of the country. Uh, for about 200 years, that was the, the capital. Then uh, from 12th to 16th century, the kingdom shifted from different places. It was not a very stable period. The uh, Dambadeniya Yapa were further south and Kurunagala, Porte. Uh, and I am not going to show any buildings of these periods because the, the kingdoms didn't last long. And uh, in certain situations, they are not explored adequately. And uh, during the post independence period, the ruins have been dis uh, destroyed also during the colonial period. Then we come to a fairly important period, which is called Gampul and Kandy. That's the, again the kingdoms. By that time, uh, the kingdoms were not very strong. Uh, but for 14th to 19th century, we have the Gampul and Kandy. Uh, Gampul is close to Kandy. Uh, it was a kingdom for a short period. So during this 400 year period, we had very interesting Buddhist and Hindu combined signs then palaces, dwelling units, wayside resting places, etc. Uh, then uh, simultaneously, or this, at the same time, we had the, uh, the maritime regions uh, occupied by the colonial powers, Western colonial powers, Portuguese from about 1500 to 52658, 
then the Dutch uh, from 1658-1796, the British, uh, they, they came in 1917-96 but captured the whole island in 1815 till 1948, then the after that the post-independence period. So we have some similarities during colonial period as well, I think, with India. I'm not going to discuss about the colonial architecture or no, the independence period architecture. Uh, but uh, basically, I'm concentrating on this 14th to 19th century period, the vernacular architecture. But before that, I will discuss slightly about Anuradhapura and Polonaro period architecture. Uh, next slide, madam. Now, this is the, the geographical location. Uh, it's on the uh, south of India. Then you can see the uh, next slide. You can see the 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 places Anuradhapura, the Polonnaruwa on the north central province, then the Kandy and the uh, the Colombo. Okay, next slide. Next. Now Anuradhapura period is about 3rd to 10th century AD, 1300 years. Basically, we have grand architecture. The stupas after the introduction of the Buddhism in the 3rd century BC, I think you have seen or we have visited Sanchi. Uh, were influenced by these uh, uh, stupas and stupa became the most important uh, edifice in the Buddhist architecture and large colossal stupas were built in Anuradhapura uh, uh, about 100 meters, 97 meters tall and this is uh, one such place, Ruangalisaya, which is uh, I would say reconstructed to some extent, not going beyond restoration uh, but it's very important place for the pilgrims. Next, next, uh, yeah, this is uh, a conserved stupa, Abegiriya, north of uh, in the no uh, northern area of Anuradhapura. It's conserved, uh, keeping the original form and the authenticity intact, material authenticity intact, uh, restored recently. So Abegiriya. Then next one is Yetan, I suppose. Next slide. Yeah, this is, a, this is a monastery. So the monasteries were like universities where large number of monks lived and they often had a lot of interaction with Indian monasteries like Nalanda uh, or the from Bharata, the Takshila uh, and then even from China, monks like Fahian Far, visited um, Sri Lanka and wrote very descriptive, uh, gave a very elaborate description about the about the his stay uh, in next and this is a pond a very large pond about uh, 50 meters wide and 150 meters long which can accommodate uh, five numbers of 50 by 30 olympic size swim pools this in a, in a monastery because you, the monasteries had about 5000 monks resident monks living studying religion as well as the other uh, disciplines like engineering medicine science etc next next slide madam yeah this is a fairly intricate a uh, pond which is called twin pond maybe you have visited so i'm not going to discuss next now sigiriya was kingdom in the middle of Anuradhapura period, 5th century AD, which was a fortress, a world heritage site. Uh, I will just run through because we have been there. Next. It's very geometrical, uh, symmetrical, but also it has very organic characters where if there's a rock, it takes the shape of the rock, but the geometry has been maintained, which has also paintings, the 5th century AD. Next. Yeah. Next slide. Now we come to Polonaro period. Again, we have grand architecture, uh, royal architecture. B basically, during Polonaro period, there were interactions with the South India, both in terms of invasions as well as in terms of uh, marriage alliances. Next. Now this is a, a which we call a, a enclosed. Uh, Buddhist stupa house. You have the stupa, 
pilgrims can go in it had a circular roof on the background you will see a brick masonry image house uh, with some kind of south indian uh, influence in architecture because during the polonaro period they had a lot of uh, interactions uh, they had invasions as well as during that period as you know south india had several kingdoms and um, the kings married from the from south india uh, i am not sure whether uh, maybe the princess came from south india were very beautiful like us but the main reason was not that uh, because when there is invasions and if you have an alliance with another king in south india when there is an invasion from south india you can ask for help either from your brother in law who is the king of another south indian kingdom or from your father in law who is your the father of the one of the queens and the king said the liberty to marry several queens so probably it was in a way a political strategy as well so with the south indian queens uh, their relatives came and they settled down and probably the architecture also had this influence from south india in addition to that we had some uh, hindu shrines next in polonnaruwa now this is an overall picture of this uh, place you can see the circular stoop house and the other buildings uh, and now this is a, a shiva shrine devala or shrine uh, as i told you because of the the, the, the connections with south india uh, probably there could have been a lot of people living in the kingdom with origins of south india and for their religious worship and rituals uh, these shiva devalas or the shiva shrines would have constructed we have about seven of them in polonnaruwa uh, kingdom anuradhapura did not have this feature it was basically at polonnaruwa you have this uh, hindu shrines uh, living next to the buddhist shrines next now we come to the important part gampola and kandy period is from 14th to 18th century and interestingly the last four kings came from south india again uh, the last uh, singhala king married uh, the the main queen was from south india uh, and they didn't have children though he had children from other queens so when he died uh, the queen's brother came and became the king uh, like that there were three other kings and who, who also embraced buddhism Uh, and uh, until the british captured the last king even the last king came from south india or a descendant from the south indian uh, royalty uh, okay now this is the picture of the city where you will again see the grand architecture uh, designed by the trained people royal patronage and uh, this is the tooth relic sign uh, okay next a closer view of the tooth relic sign which was developed over long period now this again a, a, a image house uh, about 10 km south of kandy uh, originally it had a masonry roofs like in polonnaruwa but kandy has a very uh, it's, it's in the wet zone of the country so the masonry roofs could not withstand the frequent rains and roofs were added later about 150 years later uh, but again belongs to the grand architectural tradition next now we come to the vernacular architecture of kandy period uh, kandy and gampola because we cannot separate some of the buildings were started in now i think the best definition of the vernacular architecture comes from bruce also hmm, in his words human architecture uh, the book hmm? Uh, it says vernacular architecture is a generalized way of design derived from folk architecture now folk architecture is the architecture of normal people uh, when you have a mud house it belongs to folk the folk tradition it may be seen as the development of the natural architecture of a region which is definable in terms of climate culture and materials so the vernacular architecture respond to the climatic conditions the culture and the material uh, the vernacular architecture probably is the best representation of people processes context of a country or a region even sri lanka is uh, is a small country smaller than most of your states 
uh, having about 20 million population only uh, 22 to be exact so uh, but even in the country you have different types of buildings architecture uh, in different regions different areas representing the, the difference of climate to a certain extent climate is not drastically different maybe there are there are variations we have a dry area and a wet area uh, but the culture of the people differs from area to area from province to province uh, then also the availability of materials and i will try to show you the different types of house forms uh, again belonging to folk architecture so for bruce also one school architecture is the is a developed version is an advanced version of the of folk architecture but it also had uh, influences from the grand tradition so the if you have a mud house in the village it is the it is it represents the folk architecture uh, if you have the tooth relic when you when you see the tooth relic building in candy it represents the grand architecture but when the when they construct a, a temple a image house uh, or a elite house for a elite or provincial ruler that will become the vernacular architecture of vernacular tradition because that is a developed version of the folk architecture sometimes it tries to borrow uh, concepts uh, material usage of use of materials uh, forms etc from the grand architecture as well but it's, it's, it's very closely related to folk architecture. It's a developed version of folk architecture. Uh, you don't have specific designers like in grand architecture. But it is very, very strongly related to the way of living of people as well as to climate because vernacular architecture evolves over time. So people try to use the same type of buildings. And if they does not fit, they make more minor modifications. So over time, you will see uh, perfect fits as uh, uh, Bruce, uh, sorry, Amos Rappaport explains in his house form and culture, uh, where the, the, the evolution of the architecture over time gives the perfect fits uh, or perfect solutions for the environmental problems of the people. Uh, so the vernacular, if you study the vernacular architecture of a country, uh, that will give you a good uh, that's a good source to study the 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 way of living the culture the way of uh, usage of materials etc i understand india also has a very rich vernacular tradition about three years back i had the opportunity to become the curator of the vernacular buildings exhibition traveling exhibition uh, of uh, your very renowned uh, architect and academic uh, Miki Deshai has initiated. He came to Sri Lanka with his uh, India Sri Lanka Foundation helped us to do the, this exhibition. And um, we had a very good uh, exhibition and attendance of a lot of people city of this uh, Indian vernacular architecture. Uh, the exhibition uh, star, uh, of the of the architect Vicky Deshai of Ahmedabad. So now I'm going to talk about the vernacular architecture of Sri Lanka. Uh, next slide, madam. Yeah, uh, under vernacular architecture, I'm going to talk about the religious vernacular architecture and the secular vernacular architecture. The religious vernacular architecture, we have lots of examples. And under secular vernacular architecture, we have few examples uh, belonging to Kandy and Gampola periods. Uh, they are located not in Kandy, not in Kandy, in the uh, outside Kandy, in the rural areas or in the small towns, but under the jurisdiction of the Kandyan kingdom. And as I have explained earlier, during this period, the Portuguese, Dutch and the British were occupying the for about short period until they captured the whole country or the Kandyan kingdom. And so in the vernacular architecture, we also see the influences of the colonial architecture as well, lesser degree, I would say. But uh, basically, it was an, it represents the evolution of the, uh, the traditional 
Sri Lankan architecture. Probably the similar type of architecture lasted or was there existed during Andhradapura and Polonaru periods as well. But we don't have examples surviving because they were constructed using fragile material like earth walls, timber roofs with uh, maybe clay tiles and clay floors, etc. Only the ruins of the grand architecture belonging to Anwar's grand Polonaru period is there now. But one can assume this vernacular architecture is not an invention during Candian period, but it was a continuation of the uh, the tradition or the vernacular tradition of the classical or the Anuradhapura and Polonaru periods as well. So under religious vernacular architecture, we have, uh, it's again, the Buddhist religion predominates in the country. We have about 70% Buddhists and about 15% Hindus and about 10% uh, uh, Muslims, Islamic, uh, following the Islamic faith, and about another, I would say, 8% of different Christian, uh, following the different Christian faith, mainly Roman Catholics. But uh, during this period, we had mainly the Buddhist image, the, Bo the Buddhist architecture. So I'm going to discuss uh, the Buddhist image houses. There are three different types: cave image houses, where there are image houses located inside a cave. Plinth type image house where the image house is built on a plinth. Image houses on stone pillars, uh, the third type. Then stupa houses, that is a stupa, small stupa, the school was so small, uh, protected by a, a building. Monk residences, Buddhist monks residences, a typical type where you can see similar examples in different places. Uh, preaching halls where the lay people will go and listen to a sermon by the Buddhist monk. Lastly, fairly interesting uh, building type, which is uh, a mixed Buddhist and Hindu shrines. Because again, during this time, there are a lot of interactions with uh, the Hinduism, and uh, some of these shrines coexist in the same site uh, a Buddhist and a Hindu, Buddhist image house and a Hindu shrine. So I'm going to discuss these uh, five types under religious vernacular architecture. Under secular vernacular architecture, where the wayside resting places and grain storage structures and the residential buildings. Now these are uh, image houses, cave image houses. Basically what they do is they uh, select a site with a cave and cut inside, I think you have been to places like Ajanta, Ellora, but at the veranda with tile roofs, either a lean roof or a, a hip roof with three sides. Hip. Uh, and you cut a drip ledge on the on the on the uh, rock to prevent the rainwater coming inside. And uh, in the cave, you plaster and paint the walls or the ceiling where you cannot have a very clear demarcation between the ceiling and the wall and also have images basically the main image is of lord buddha in the reclining posture because you you don't have a ha good height next slide now this is another cave image house uh, so the, the the front portion with the tile roofs the tiles are clay tiles flat clay tiles we, in Sri Lanka, we have three types of tiles. Uh, at the in the rock, you will see a clay tile, which is called flat tile, flat clay tile, which is a traditional Sri Lankan tile, which now is used only for religious buildings. The second one is half round tiles, half round tiles, which was introduced by the Portuguese, though we call it local tile. The third tile is Calicut tile because the British imported these tiles from Calicut, of uh, I think. Uh, Karnataka, or oh, yes, uh, or oh, from Bangalore. So we call it basically Calicut tiles. Uh, the third type, which is the which was introduced to Sri Lanka by the British. So this is another uh, 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 cave type image house. When you go in, you will have the 
image uh, uh, and the painted walls. Next, please. Now, this is a section where you have a reclining Buddha at the main statue, but you will also have a, a image in the seated posture, but small because of the restrictions inside. Uh, now the, the, all the measured drawings that I am showing are done by the students of architecture during their first year at uh, the university because we have a measured drawing project and generally they measure vernacular buildings of the country going to different places and we have tried to uh, publish them in the book formats. Next please. Again a cave image also is a measured drawing. Uh, always it had a front veranda. Now this is a plinth type image house. You can see a about uh, 600 millimeter plinth, raised plinth from the surrounding ground level. And at the rear you have the main shrine. And in the front you have a mandapa or a pavilion where the rituals like drumming, etc. will happen. Uh, and the rear building has a double slope. The main area is has a steeper slope and the veranda has a lesser slope uh, basically highlighting the main shrine of the inner centum and uh, they are small in scale um, but they were set in very nice sites locations uh, and uh, always had a intermediate space around the walls didn't come up to the edge you had a veranda or a walkway, columns, uh, etc. in the in the in the periphery. Next slide, please. Another image house uh, of the plinth type. The plinth is raised so that the dampness did not come into the building because the walls were painted. Inner walls were painted. Uh, depicting basically the reincarnations of the previous births of Lord Buddha. Uh, basically, for the pilgrims to understand and worship. But main, again, the main feature is the, st is the is a statue uh, in the seated posture. Next slide. Yeah, you will see the another plinth type image house, two, gu two guardian deities at the entrance and the main door to go in again raised prevent the dampness coming in because with the dampness you get the efflorescence and the subflorescence coming and damage in the paintings the paintings were done using the local pigments next slide now this is an very interesting building time this is the third uh, type of image house now it's similar to the print type image house but the difference is, instead of a print, the building is constructed on stone pillars. Uh, the stone pillars, the height of the stone pillars vary from 600 millimeters to about 2,700 millimeters. The, if it is 600 millimeters, the space below is not used for any function, just kept as a void. If it is about 2,700, 2,500, the ground floor is used as a place of congregation. Uh, you, we have about 300 of these in the, all parts of the country. Uh, very interesting building type because again, uh, it gives uh, different advantages or oh, architecturally, the, 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 the image house is, is, is belongs to the, belongs to, it's a sacred space. So when you raise it above ground, it very clearly conveys the message that it has this sacredness character. It is above ground. It is not sitting on the ground. It has a different uh, architectural representation. But in terms of function, it also serves the stone pillars prevent the dampness coming from the ground into the mud walls because the walls are mud and the beams are timber. And the floor is timber, columns are timber, roof members structure is timber. So it prevents the 
the dampness coming from the ground during rainy period to the building it also prevents the termites and the insects coming into the building from the ground because if you see the insects coming in a line uh, you can very clearly identify it because it's in the stone pillar and remove it generally the insects will not go up in these stones uh, the plan again you will have a, a or a wide space like a veranda or a corridor in the on the periphery and the, in the inner side you have this uh, shrine the shrines are slightly smaller than the print type image houses but the plan form might be the same sometimes a building will have a front pavilion which is not of the uh, not on stone pillars it might be on uh, a plinth but sometimes the building will be there without uh, without a, a pavilion okay next now this is probably the largest uh, image house on stone pillars in the north central province the ground floor is used as a congregation space you have two stair uh, flight of steps fairly steep to climb uh, again you will see the roof form which is double sloping highlighting the significance of the inner sanctum but this roof was used only for the sacred buildings not for not for the uh, secular buildings so in the same site you might have a monk's residence which has a single pitch next slide now again uh, image house fairly rudimental uh, but instead of a instead of a walkway it has a wall around so it has double walls actually you have the inner sanctum you have a, instead of a horrid columns you have the outer sanctum basically this is as you see it's located in a rocky side and in this area the reflected heat will come into the building onto the walls inner sanctum and it might uh, damage the paintings in long run so instead of the walkway you have a second wall on the periphery which is a fairly unique type found in certain uh, parts of the country where you have dry climate and rocky areas uh, in the temple next slide yeah same side uh, you can see the double walls instead of the walkway you have this double walls and in the picture you can see the main image image uh main image and the uh, other images on the side uh, the deities uh, vishnu is considered as an important deity in buddhism uh, and uh, the walls inner walls are painted next side now this is a very interesting building though it's not in very good uh, conserved form uh, uh, it's between like colombo and andradapura in the uh, it has a lower level roof protecting the timber members uh, getting the wind uh, rain with the wind and uh, uh, the angular timber supports representing a typical vernacular architecture uh, influenced from the folk tradition uh, on the background you will see a small uh, fairly large reservoir at upper level constructed for pedifies you will not see the you will see only the bund uh, on the background uh, in a very nice location though it's not well protected uh, conserved one of the best examples of the sri lankan vernacular architecture uh, showing the response to climate because in sri lanka we have a monsoon rain not coming in vertical direction but also 45 degrees or even 60 degrees angle so you need this eaves and canopies to protect the inner, inner spaces okay next yeah this is the measured drawing of the same building 
uh, you can see the details the statues again these mission drawings don't run, were done by the first year students following the architecture degree yeah next slide now we come to another bit now this so that's all about image houses we have uh, three types of image houses cave type print type and the uh, image houses on the stone, stone pillars now we come to the stoop houses uh, unlike in Polonna Rua, where you had circular image houses, these are, and in Polonna Rua or Androidburg period, you have to the stoop house, you can go in, like at uh, Ajanta. Though so that's, a, that's, a, that's a rock cut stoop house. Uh, in Androidburg and Polonna, we had this tiled roofs. But in Canyon period, we had small stoopers, probably painted, though today you will see white. The, the pilgrims cannot go in. They have to worship from outside. They will not get a proper peak, a proper view of the stupa because of the roof. But the stupa was protected through a roof. Uh, next slide. Yes. So you see the section. The center of the roof was not supported above the pinnacle of the roof stupa. Next. Next slide, madam. Under this was small... Uh, Super house near to, near Candy. Next slide. Yeah, section of the same super house. Now this is uh, Gadlazenia, which is one of the main temples. Again, closer to Candy. The main super had a super house and the four small supers around it. Uh, now we come to preaching halls. Uh, preaching halls were also important where the, the monks met people, the lay people, and they delivered sermons on a full moon day or otherwise. That is the place where the, it was also a community gathering place. Uh, things related to religion or otherwise happen. So you will see the section, one of the largest uh, preaching halls in the country at Pazinia. Next. Now we come to monk residences. Uh, we had also a typical type of plan where the, the monks had their uh, sleeping quarters, a veranda where the monks met the lay people, but inside the sleeping quarters were located around the central court. Uh, because in Kandy you have high level of dampness, but also that central courtyard gave privacy. So the, the sleeping quarters had only a door open to the court with a walkway around it, not windows outside, so they had privacy. Next. Now, this is the uh, inner courtyard uh, and the walkway. Uh, and the, from the uh, walkway, you can enter into the small uh, sleeping quarters or the rooms of the monks where one monk would have occupied one cell. That's the plan. You will see the front veranda, courtyard, small cells, and the rear side is the uh, refectory where the people of the village will bring the meals or the monks eat only uh, the breakfast and the lunch, uh, but otherwise they can prepare a small meal. This is a section of the court through the courtyard. Yeah, next. That is a courtyard type monk residence. So the courtyard was very in, very intimate, but that was a private space for the monks. Yeah, plan of the same. And the front veranda was for the lay people to meet the monk to get advice on one-to-one -one basis. On, a, on the uh, central courtyard, walkway didn't have columns on the two sides. What you can see the rooms. Now we come to the fairly interesting this bullion type, which is mixed Buddhist and Hindu shrines. Uh, because during Kandyan period, again, uh, the mm. Hindu practices uh, became uh, uh, into the culture of the people, and as Buddhism very clearly says that it cannot help people to achieve something. 
Uh, though there are gods in the belief of gods in the Buddhism, it advocates people to find their own salvation. So, uh, but for people, the help from God or seeking assistance from God became important. And this kind of shrines were constructed in different parts of the, in different villages, where you will have a, a, a shrine room dedicated to a God, particular God, localized, either Vishnu, basically it's Vishnu or Patini, the goddess. Uh, and um, you, on the side, you might have another Buddhist shrine. But sometimes you have back to back where you have a Buddhist shrine and on the back you will have a Hindu shrine, but both have access from two sides. So if you are coming from one direction, that is the main shrine. So if you are coming from say east side, that is the Buddhist shrine has the, is the main shrine. But if you are coming from the west, the Hindu shrine is the main shrine. But in certain situations, uh, on site at Gatlazania, it's at right angle where they share a common lobby. So they are right angle. If you are coming from uh, to the Buddhist shrine, you walk, you you have one axis, and if you are coming from to the Hindu shrine, another you know, axis. But they share in front of the two shrines a common lobby. Next, again uh, a small uh, Hindu shrine. Uh, the main chamber of the god is at the rear, where you will. Look, the, in architecturally, there it looks like a two-story building, but you cannot go. It's just to highlight the uh, the shrine of the god. Next. Now this is the fourth, probably the most uh, important shrine in terms of architecture, Ambaka, which has not very nice uh, wood carvings. Uh, so you have the front open pavilion, several chambers uh, before going into the last inner chamber where you will see again a two-storied area with a roof, but it is not accessible. It's not two-storied really. Again, just highlighting the important space. Next. Uh, this is the this is the front elevation of the Ambak. On the side, you will see the main uh, Hindu shrine and on the side, uh, the Buddhist image house. Next. Now, this is the long elevation of the Ambak. Now we come to uh, the secular architecture and uh, uh, one of the very important building types of the secular architecture is the wayside resting places. Uh, because people walk on foot and at different places they constructed structures for travelers to rest. Generally near a stream facing a paddy field so people walking can rest stay overnight it had uh, a water pot uh, maintained by the people in the village and sometimes cooking utensils so people travelers will bring dry ration and cook and stay overnight and then start their journey it was also used as a community gathering place of the people of the in the village also a resting place for the farmers also when the government officers if they come from the kingdom or from a provincial ruler a place where they collected tax, also a space where they had uh, the activities connected to law and order, like uh, hearing a case, uh, law, uh, 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 like a courthouse. Okay, this is uh, uh, sitting on uh, boulders, like in this, the the image houses, not on stone pillars but on stone boulders, uh, but timber structure and uh, timber beams timber roof so this is the section very intricate and very uh, nicely done it's just an open pavilion this is uh, another wayside resting place now are done it's a plinth type on a plinth where you have inner space you can see some people uh, near candy again yeah next section of the same resting place. Now this is, uh, so after resting places, we come to brain storage structures because for people, the food security was important and for them, paddy was the main staple food. And uh, sometimes the paddy was cultivated once a year, sometimes twice a year, depending on the availability of the water. 
and they store paddy in a storage structure and your 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 wealth was shown not by your house or by other things but by the number of grain storage structures that that you own uh, so this is one such example again raised from the ground to prevent dampness and the insects coming in walls were out of mud roof straw and you can uh, store a large quantity of uh, grain paddy tier and sometimes if you uh, have the correct variety you can store it for about 3 years without any problem and one would say there is very uh, connection between this kind of this probably belongs to folk architecture too uh, the temperature the image houses on stone pillars and the ambalamas had an influence from this kind of folk architecture next now this is again a grain storage structure at the devala because in devala or the, the sorry the hindu uh, buddhist shrines uh, when they go they what they offered is not money they took grains and offered it to the the shrine so the grains were stored and these were stored houses where you have a roof and large chambers to store and you put the grain from top but you can uh, get it out from bottom uh, this at the one of the hindu buddhist shrines another grain storage structure similar type on stone pillars clay walls timber roof clay tile timber roof next now these are the different grain storage structures on top you have this bisser so the uh, more uh, folk tradition buildings and on the bottom on the right side you will see this uh, the atwas or the uh, structures with tile roofs so there are different types for different types of uh, grains and for different uh, periods for a short period you will have a very temporary grain storage structure but all of them are raised from the ground so that termites dampness did not come next now uh, now we come to the houses for the last type now i am discussing uh, the houses in sri lanka we have traditional houses in different provinces and they had very specific characters they were different though the country was small from region to region the house types were different in the same region you will have similar type of houses but basically they were respond to climate the culture etc but on today probably with globalization with modernization with televisions we see similar type of house from colombo to jaffna to goa uh, same materials and probably we might have copied versions of houses from abroad also becoming popular in other in time to come but uh, during candian period and during this this tradition continued even during british period uh, the different geographical areas provinces had different types of houses now this a traditional candian farmers house central court in the middle and few rooms and again a grain storage structure in the main space the kitchen rooms for females to sleep and to keep valuables didn't have windows the central courtyard was the main uh, source for ventilation and lighting maybe had one door or two doors so that's in the candian or the central part of the country where the dampness heavy rain was there next now this is in the north central province that is in anuradhapura area where you have a long house with a front veranda but in the front in the front compound you will have the grain storage structures uh, it's basically clay walls and the uh, straw thatch roofs and to go to one room to other you have to come out to the veranda security was not a problem but what you have is these houses sharing a common compound so several houses maybe 10 houses sharing a common compound which is called puranagama or the traditional village this is from jaffna where predominantly the tamils live uh, you have a big compound and in the compound you have several units main house 
ancillary houses out houses kitchen uh, how uh, 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 a building for the cows and the cattle or the cattle shed uh, but the boundary is protected by a a a kaja type of a not coconut uh, the that uh, fence okay next uh, this is again a central province what i discussed earlier it is it has a veranda slightly different to the central court yard uh, a surviving example of a house in the canyon province this is in the southern province you can see the british and the dutch influences uh, basically dutch influences front veranda half round tiles again a surviving example next northern province you can see a courtyard uh, front veranda and a courtyard in jaffna uh, a traditional house now the last uh, two slides i will discuss about the influences of vernacular architecture on contemporary architecture we have two uh, main persons involved with uh, their architectural style was highly influenced by the vernacular tradition of sri lanka they had other influences from the modern movement from european architecture from british from dutch but the main influences came from vernacular architecture and they tried to uh, create a new style of architecture uh, contemporary sri lankan architecture which is not found in elsewhere uh, the first one is jeffrey bawa as you have visited uh, Uh, and he did lots of buildings um, from hotels houses to the parliament new parliament in colombo near colombo uh, and uh, universities but the main influence came from the traditional vernacular candian period architecture but he was also influenced from the dutch architecture to a lesser degree from the british architecture but also his exposure to the italy especially and the mediterranean Uh, next now this is uh, one of the universities in the south part southern part of sri lanka uh, designed by jeffrey bawa in 1980s you can see the the type of architecture is near sea and sprawling buildings verandas walkways uh, sloping roofs etc next slide now we have another architect though not very famous mina de silva the first female asian architect uh, she had lot of connections with india she i think studied architecture at, at bombay first uh, worked with uh, prabhu zia i think in chandika project and all uh, though she was not not commercially but she was very innovative till her death she was trying to innovate Uh, and uh, she is from kandy her father is from a minister in the government at that time but uh, she tried to innovate lots of things on her own and regarded as one of the pioneers in creating a, a sri lankan contemporary style of architecture both of them passed away now this is one of the houses uh, done by the minnet now in sri lankan vernacular one of the key points is that the uh, so that's all about the sites that i have uh, one of the key points if you look at the sri lankan vernacular <coughs> is that it has very close in and out relationship you don't have a clear demarcation between inside and outside you have inside you have outside but in between you have a veranda you have a pergola space you have a uh, in between space so you the space flows the interior space shows in i think jeffrey bawa use this to the maximum uh, if you ask to draw the line between the inside and outside in a jeffrey bawa building it will be very very difficult uh, because it's uh, there are lots of transitional space is just in between so there was a very close relationship between inside to outside because outside the garden people live most of the time outdoors unless there is rain in shade lot of activities happen in shade the climate is not harsh even if you sleep outside uh, nothing will happen in the night unless in a place like norelia uh, throughout the year 
so the at it's very green because of the rain and the climatic conditions uh, so in and out relationship is one thing then also people like jeffrey i think and even minute very clearly said roof is the most important and the dominant element of sri lankan architecture uh, because it's it has heavy rains and the, with wind it comes in so the roof became the most dominant most important element in the in the architecture of the buildings then also uh, the solid to white relationships uh, you 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 had this uh, very interesting solid walls and the windows the solid white relationship and because people lived outdoors they didn't want huge windows uh, so interior were used for certain functions and to suit that the interiors were created and um, the windows were not very large but they also had very interesting uh, relationship between interior to outer exterior uh, and the surrounding landscape was considered as an very important influencing force of architecture both in the kandian period vernacular as well as the contemporary architecture of people like jeffrey bow uh, so i think i have come to the end of my time allocation uh, thank you very much uh, and if you have any questions i think we will have the discussion after the next presentation by architect chintaka i think it's at 12 o'clock uh, thank you very much yes sir. um thank you so much sir for such an insightful presentation i'm very sure that it has raised a lot of questions and answered a lot of them as well um now i think dr vibhuti sachdev has some critical observations um ma'am yeah i mean uh, should i come in just now or um, after uh, the next presentation as you like maybe i I mean, I I can come in briefly just now for five five minutes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, for a very enlightening uh, presentation and also a kind of a really broad sweep uh, of history that you uh, gave us. You know, uh, with unimaginable timelines. You know, going from BC third century BC to uh, 1990s, which is uh, also you know a very valuable. Uh, you know lecture in that regard that you know it gives you a sense of the historic past and and the layers uh, of your uh, great uh, culture i think uh, because because of the various uh, you know various uh, things in the past um what your presentation also highlights and this is uh, ma mainly for the students uh, uh, so allow me to kind of Uh, engage in your presentation as a way of alerting them to certain aspects of uh, continuity and traditions and uh, both our countries have such layered cultures that that uh, we need to kind of just um, uh, you know um, in a way articulate as to what happens and what are the processes of uh, history writing as well and uh, of course the way history is written and told is also the way we perceive things uh, and it very much influences our mindset so um um you know and and one of the key points is that at every with every historical moment every historical phase it is uh, it is you know the the present uh, influences the reading of our past and we have to be very alert to that as well so you know our present situation will influence how we see our past or how how we read it and and in that way history is a verb it's not a finished task of course the job of the historian is to weave those facts in order to tell a story convincingly and um, you know each each phase of history in a way tells its own story and uh, so there are many histories of our past rather than one history and which um, dr chandrasekhar has also demonstrated that there are various phases that that although uh, seem uh, to be working in silos of course there is it is interlinked you know really really closely um the other thing that i wanted to say so each each you know each um regime each political domain each you know wave of politics for for example uh, 
you know, let's say nationalism, which is closest to our timeline. Um, and uh, we went through, you know, 1840s to 1950s, a wave of nationalism in our country, where we, uh, and you know that, you know, Indian nationalism also was a way of finding our civilization, was a way of finding who we are as a nation. So, in a way, you know, um, there was this kind of um, emphasis on focusing on things that unite us as a body of people rather than divide us. So the Indian nationalists, especially in visual arts uh, and architecture as well, uh, you know, famously Abhinendranath Tagore's paintings, if you see, were very much influenced by Chuktai, who was influenced by the Japanese aesthetics. And also it was very, we were very influenced by the Buddhist uh, philosophy because it kind of leaps over, you know, the the British period and the Mughal period and the you know and and goes into this very far remote phase which we can hardly touch. So it is a very you know safe methodology of kind of you know going so far back allows you to imagine um, you know uh, wonderful futures because you don't have to get into the daily grind of that past because it's so far removed. And it is, you know, it is a very interesting and therefore very important exercise. So appropriation of the past, and you will see uh, to this, you know, not this day, but so, you know, look at how the stupa, you know, uh, then becomes a symbol for, for our institutions. And this is how, you know, Buddhist nationalism also shaped us. Uh, Indian nationalism, you know, rooted in Buddhism shaped us. Because if you see, um, you know, the Viceroy's house, for example, that Lacton's design, you know, the dome is a stupa, is the Sanchi stupa. And, and then, you know, the Eastern Court, Western Court also have those domes. To even Korea's building, which is in um, Bhopal, you know, uh, also has that dome. So suddenly you once saw these kind of institutional buildings for them to be kind of identified as authority, they had to have this dome. So it's very Panofskian also idea of using a symbol, an icon, to kind of then project one's identity. And, and this is how what, what was happening in architecture and, and, the, and the force of, you know, the Buddhist iconography was very strong and, and still plays in our minds. Uh, so one has to be alert to these, the power of these symbols that we use in our daily uh, life and to be alert as to where it comes from and who is trusting those, you know, even if we can't do anything about it, it's fine. It's very enriching to be alert. The second thing I wanted to uh, also talk about briefly uh, is the process of architecture. You see, of course, um, we say vernacular architecture, but the moment, the moment you make plan section elevation of vernacular architecture, you've changed it. It's no longer vernacular. It becomes modern. Because uh, when people are building those vernacular huts and you know they're, they're, they negotiate design in a codified manner. So they're not producing designs and negotiating designs through plan section elevation. It's our representation of vernacular architecture, which in a way, um, again, a kind of, um, I'm just raising a red flag. There's nothing wrong with this methodology, but it kind of, in a way, removes us twice from the object of the study because we're neither using those vernacular terms, we're not using, looking at the processes which define, say, you know, how wide this gallery is going to be and how, you know, how much the material in itself dictates the width of the gallery and the height of the room. And also in terms of our language, I want the students to be alert to, you know, um, how much of the vernacular language are we actually using to describe uh, the structures that we were perhaps using some other language. And uh, there is a strong uh, presence of, uh, you know, the British and, and then post <laughs> us, you know, using English to describe. And that has limitations. We can't do anything about it. We are in an English medium university. We have to follow those structures. But it is important to be alert. And it is important to kind of then look out for resources we can tap into you know, and uh, enrich, you know, bring in the layers of complexity that 
that the vernacular also has to offer. The third uh, point I wanted to make is about the categorization of architecture in terms of religious, secular, you know, monumental, simple, ordinary, and you know how much of this uh, is on the basis of what survives, uh, because you know, may, you know, maybe much of the you know architecture we know that you know this is this we know from reading of Arthashastra even you know a cursory reading of us Arthashastra will tell you that there, there were these fantastic wooden uh, you know buildings which would have not lasted so we just have to imagine uh, using uh, literary sources to imagine the setting of these buildings what i'm what i'm saying is that yes the monuments arise from the past but the context doesn't does not mean that it didn't have a context so so i would urge the students to use as many sources as possible to you know, to populate that imagined field of that, you know, building that survives from, you know, century BC and to kind of visualize because, you know, you as architects have great power of imagination and visualization. So you, you should use it to its fullest and, and think, you know, this building is not standalone building. It would have had communities and contexts and, and it would have gone through various periods of use as well. So um be alert to that and um i want to uh, finish on a, a personal note i'm a great fan of jeffrey bauer i am not alone in this world to be so he was my idol as a student continues to be and he you know and as dr chandrashekhar also mentioned you know he was really uh, so uh, you know so good at kind of um, bringing the landscape in you know for him architecture was uh, about bringing the outdoors in and that speaks a lot uh, and david robson has as a book complete work so and i'm sure there are other other people young architects who are also exploring such fine subtleties of your great culture and um, and the lush surroundings that sri lanka you know has and possesses and and the layering of such wonderful uh, Minith De Silva, of course, also was involved in the Mark um, publication. She was very active in the progressive modern prog progressive group. So um, I want to end, end, and I look forward to the next presentation. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Vibhuti. I think uh, Rashi is a little stumped by her, uh, <laughs> all that you have said right now, and I think. I think these stu our students have always, you know, kind of had these concerns, and they've been struggling with it inside the, uh, you know, in their uh, design expressions. They wonder how much of vernacular is relevant. Uh, is it really relevant in a public scenario? What does it mean today? What does it mean for the future? And I think a lot of those questions will now be addressed further by uh, uh, the next talk. And uh, you know, I mean, we'll give us some examples. Rashi, please go ahead, do your bit. Uh, yes, ma'am, you present, Vigani, ma'am. Um, thank you so much, ma'am. Just a second. Let's stop the record. Restart the recording. Exactly.